Hello, and welcome to Portable Data Exfiltration, XSS for PDFs. In this talk, I'm gonna show you how to booby trap a PDF document, track when a PDF is opened or closed, even when loaded from the file system, and exfiltrate the contents of an unknown PDF on both Acrobat and on Chrome. All these techniques use a PDF injection. My colleague, James Kettle, was watching a Black Hat talk about PDFs. And he was looking at the PDF code and thought to himself, this looks injectable. And he got back to the office and we had a discussion about the uh, PDF presentation. And he said to me, PDF code is totally injectable. And I responded, I think it's impossible. You wouldn't know the structure of the PDF. The XREF table wouldn't work. The objects wouldn't be linked to. I just can't see how that would work. But that didn't stop me there. I then began to test for PDF injection. So first I'm gonna cover injection theory, how you can get user input inside a PDF, why you just can't inject arbitrary content. I'll talk about my methodology I use to test the various libraries. I'll discuss two libraries that I exploited and I will discuss exploiting the injections on Chrome and Acrobat, as well as an, a hybrid injection that works on both. And I'll wrap up with defense and that will leave five minutes for questions. So server-side PDF generation is everywhere. It's in invoices, in receipts, in e-tickets, in pay slips, in boarding passes, the list is endless. So there's plenty of opportunity to get user input inside a PDF document. If you think of a PDF injection point as XSS, for example, and imagine your XSS uh, vulnerability executes within a parenthesis and in a function call, then this is the same sort of situation you get with PDF injection. Like in a JavaScript injection, you need to ensure that the syntax is valid. So your injection needs to be valid and the existing code needs to be valid. And this means you need to repair the code uh, before the injection as well as after the injection. So how a PDF is structured. So we have objects, we have the XREF table, and we've got the trailer. So the objects allow you to define images and text streams. The XREF table points to each of those images in the document, and the trailer is at the end of the document and specifies the root uh, object. So here's what an object looks like in PDF code. So this is the first object with one, the revision of the object, which is zero, and then the keyword for the starting of the object. And this is a dictionary. So dictionaries begin with those characters, and we also have a dictionary key, in this case, pages. So pages refers to the uh, amount of pages in the document. And you'll notice the two space zero space R. This is a reference in um, PDF code. So what references do is allow you to link to other objects in the PDF document. So this is, get, this is saying, go to uh, object number two, revision number zero, um, and link that to that object, and that will define how many pages are on the page. And that's the end of the dictionary. So this is super basic uh, intro to how a PDF object is structured, but it'll give you enough information to understand the rest of this talk. So this is the XREF table. So an XREF table always begins with the XREF keyword. Now, uh, the PDF specification specifies that you have um, a blank object at the start with a specific revision number. So this, this one is free um, and that's what F indicates. After that object that is not used in the PDF document, you have the first object and the number refers to the position in the document where this object occurs. So in this case, it's 10. So it's saying at 10 position of the document, the first object is located. The star XREF uh, keyword tells you where 
the start of the XREF table occurs. So in this case, it's 413. So this tells you tells the client where the XREF table begins. So I want to give you a little bit of information about how the PDF is parsed. This is uh, an ultra high level view of it, um, just so you can understand where our injections occur. So the start XREF is read and points to the XREF table. The XREF table then lists all the objects. So the client, the PDF client, will look through all of the XREF table to gather all the objects. And if you're gonna do an injection, it's probably gonna occur within an object itself. So our payload will be executed within an object. So our payload will be executed when the object's executed and then the document is rendered. So we have text streams and we have annotations. In a text stream, you can define your own text using a parenthesis. So we have a, an object here, which is number four. It's got a length with the dictionary key length and the stream indicates it's a stream object. The BT stands for uh, begin text and we have the font and the font size. And then finally, we have where our injection can occur. So inside parenthesis, you can define your text, which will be displayed on screen. So if you can inject an, a closing parenthesis, then you can inject your own code. But there's a couple of problems we have here. So if the length is different, when you inject your code, then the object won't be rendered. And you'll need knowledge about the PDF when you inject here uh, in order to link to other objects. So I tried this on various libraries and I was unsuccessful in exploiting text streams. And this was because for two reasons. One, the, um, the parentheses were escaped correctly by the library. And two, the, you, you couldn't inject any code because that would break the structure of the PDF. So I was unsuccessful in exploiting text streams. However, I encountered annotations and annotations are great. They let you specify a link anywhere in the document. So you create a new annotation, you give it a rectangle, an area on the page to click, you give it a border or whatever, and you specify an action. And that action can have a URI property or a URI dictionary key. And in parenthesis, you can specify a URI. So our injection can occur here. And this looks miles more promising for PDF injection attacks because we don't need knowledge of the PDF. We can just inject another annotation and that won't affect the length of the uh, object. So it looks far more promising to inject inside annotations. So I was testing various libraries. I think I got to about eight and I came up with the following methodology, identify, construct and exploit. So first you need to identify, can you break out of parentheses or can you use backslashes to escape the escapes added by the library? I tried multi-byte characters. So I used, for example, 5C29, which is the backslash and a close in parentheses. And the library may convert those multi-byte characters to single-byte characters and allow you to escape the annotation. I tried overflowing the ASCII value, so higher than the maximum amount allowed in ASCII, um, and that could overflow to other characters that might bypass the check. Um, I tried causing um, parsing errors by injecting nulls and injecting end of file markers, and also comments. Once I identified that the uh, library was vulnerable, then I tried to construct the attack. So there's two ways to construct the attack. You can call the alert one function if you have a PDF that is not blind. So you've got a reflected PDF injection vulnerability. So you can use the alert function. Uh, so it's app.alert in Acrobat or in Chrome, and that will tell you whether the injection was successful. 
But if you have a blind vulnerability, so a blind PDF injection, you have no idea what the um, PDF structure is going to be like. You don't actually interact with the PDF. Somebody else d does, but you have no idea what that PDF looks like then you can use a callback using the submit form function in JavaScript or the submit form function in PDF actions. And then once you've identified that the, the victim has clicked on um, somewhere in the PDF and your, um, your exploit, then you can build your exploit to steal the contents of that unknown PDF using the submit form function. Or you can steal the contents of the PDF without JavaScript using the submit form action. So on two vulnerable libraries. So I tested around eight uh, libraries until I encountered a vulnerable one. The first vulnerable library was called pdf-lib. This is an NPM uh, module um, and works with Node and it gets around 52, well, over 52,000 weekly downloads. But they made a pretty huge mistake. So here's some JavaScript on the um, it, uh, displayed on screen that allows you to construct a PDF. And you can create an annotation, and that annotation has a helper, uh, which is called pdfstring.of. So if we zoom into that, this is the vulnerable code. So the URI property um, is using this function, and your input lands inside this function. And what you can do, you can inject a parenthesis to break out of that um, text stream or annotation URI stream, and you can break your, you can inject your own PDF code. The next library I encountered is JS PDF. This has over a quarter of a million weekly downloads. So it's quite popular. They had a, you can define annotations using their API, and in their API, they have a URL property. And the URL property was vulnerable to PDF injection, like the previous example. So here, your input occurs in this URL property, and you can inject parentheses to inject your own PDF code. So now let's talk about exploiting injections on Acrobat. So this is the alert one of PDF injection. So like you've got an alert one in JavaScript, this is the same sort of style for PDF injection. So first we break out of the PDF string using the closing parenthesis. We use the JS dictionary to define our JavaScript. So in this case, app.alert1. We repair the existing action using an opening parenthesis. And then this will create an alert box to prove that our injection worked. I use this style of injection across many different injections um, to prove my injection worked and then build up on that and improve it. So although I had JavaScript execution, there was a couple of challenges. And those challenges were the limitations of Acrobat JavaScript. You couldn't access the DOM you couldn't read cookies. You only had a basic selection of objects to choose from. So although you've got JavaScript execution, you're limited on what you can do in Acrobat JavaScript. But I thought, well, we can exfiltrate the contents of the PDF. So we've got JavaScript execution. Why don't we get the contents of the PDF? So here I injected the um, submit form function and called it to an external collaborator URL and passed the submit as property to the submit form um, function object and specified PDF. This would then steal the contents of the entire PDF, which is pretty cool because if you have a blind PDF injection, then you can get the entire contents of that PDF whenever the user clicks anywhere on the PDF. You could also do this without JavaScript, which might be important when a client does not support JavaScript, but allows you to use the submit form action. So here I'm injecting um, a new annotation 
I specify the submit form action, give it an external collaborator URL, and then um, pass the uh, opening parenthesis to uh, continue the, um, the rest of the code. I use uh, the flags uh, dictionary key. Um, and if you specify 256, then this means the entire contents of the PDF will be submitted to that external location. So this is really handy for blind PDF injection. And I found a way to booby trap the entire PDF document. So no matter where the victim clicks on the page, this uh, JavaScript or uh, submit form action will be called. So first I inject a separate annotation. I specify the rect uh, dictionary key, which specifies where on the page you want the annotation to be clickable. So in this case, it's the X and Y coordinate and the width and height. And this makes the entire page clickable. And then I use the existing parenthesis to complete the injection. You can also execute automatically on Acrobat, which is really powerful because you can inject an annotation and all the victim needs to do is open the PDF. You can do this using the PV dictionary key. Once that's been specified, then the annotation will execute automatically when the page is loaded. There is also a PC uh, dictionary key, and this executes when the PDF is closed. So you can do an injection on a blind PDF injection. The victim can open the PDF. You know when the victim has opened it and when the victim has closed it. It is super powerful. So then I came up with the shortest possible access uh, PDF vector. And here we have the existing code on the page. And on Acrobat, what you can do is reuse the existing annotation regardless of what it is. So in this case, it's a URI, but it will allow you to inject um, your own value for the, the current annotation and execute JavaScript. And this is the shortest that I, I managed to get the vector to. So it's pretty cool. Um, we inject a JavaScript that uses the existing action. We call the alert function and we use the existing parenthesis to complete the injection. So I think that's probably the shortest um, PDF injection vector possible but I challenge you to try and find one shorter. So I've mentioned that we can open, um, you can track when a PDF is opened or closed automatically uh, from an annotation. But what about when you're loading a PDF from the file system? Well, there are a couple of challenges. Post requests are blocked, so the user gets a prompt whether to allow or deny them. Well, that's not very good for uh, an attacker. Is there a way that we can make a request automatically, regardless if the user clicks allow or deny? Well, I wrote an enumerator to do just that. So I wrote an enumerator to loop through all the um, objects and call every single function and pass a collaborator URL as the argument. And I skipped the um, functions that I knew required a prompt um, and then uh, waited to see what results I would get. And I found a function. It's called CBS Shared Review If Offline Dialog. Wow. Okay, that's a mouthful. That is interesting though. Um, so what happens is it makes a DNS request regardless what option you choose in the prompt, which is really cool because we can track when a user opens or closes the PDF from the file system. And we can enumerate the contents of the PDF using DNS and steal the contents of the PDF. And this is what the dialog looks like. So when you execute the function, it makes the DNS request and it says, Acrobat Reader cannot connect to the review server and then shows the reverse DNS. 
So I know that that has worked correctly, and I get an interaction in Burp to tell to tell me that um, the uh, request has been made. And you've got two options: work offline or keep trying. And it doesn't matter which they click, which is cool. Um, so you can track when the uh, user opened and closed the PDF without any user interaction. So I was quite pleased with exploiting Acrobat, but I wanted to exploit Chrome too. So I wanted to uh, use my existing injections on Chrome, but they all failed. So I tried all the existing vectors and they didn't work. So then I tried to overwrite the URL. So instead of executing JavaScript, I simply tried to change the URL. So I did this by injecting an additional annotation in the annotations array and specified a URI and specified an external uh, URL. And um, this allowed me to overwrite the URL, which was pretty cool. So I could overwrite the existing action with a new action that would then change the URL. But we can't exfiltrate the PDF from that. So there was a couple of challenges. So the Acrobat vert vectors didn't work. JavaScript didn't work in annotations. We could use over we could overwrite the URL, which was something, but it was still not as impressive as executing JavaScript. So can we make JavaScript work work in Chrome? Well, this was my first attempt to create JavaScript execution from a PDF injection on Chrome. And as you can see, it's a lot of code, a lot of PDF injection. And some of parts of it requires knowledge and references to different objects in the PDF, which of course we can't have because we have no knowledge of this PDF. So I managed to reduce a lot of that code. And um, with this injection vector, this will execute JavaScript on Chrome. First, the field type is required, so in this case, a button, and the value of the button, in this case, it doesn't matter, we just put A, but whenever you have the, um, it, if you link the annotation to a submit form button, then Chrome will allow JavaScript execution on that annotation, which is super handy. Um, so there was a couple of challenges. So no knowledge of the PDF is needed, which is cool, but we are restricted by PDF um, and the capabilities of uh, the JavaScript. So I could call the submit form function, but it will not en enable me to steal the entire contents of the PDF. So it doesn't support all the features that Acrobat supports. So there was a couple of challenges there that I needed, needed to solve. So of course I wrote an, an enumerator and I enumerated every object and property uh, and first I did a for loop and used get on property names to gather all the properties. Then because um, Acrobat doesn't allow the console um, object like Acrobat does, um, I had to output the data in chunks so I could gather all the information in an alert box. So here I add um, the various properties to the chunks um, of the data and then output each of the chunks um, to give me a list of properties supported by that object. And I found some cool functions. Get page number of words, get page nth word. These sound really promising for stealing the contents of the PDF. So here's how I extracted text from a Chrome PDF injection. So I used the base uh, injection, as I mentioned previously. So we inject the form button on the parent um, dictionary key, and then we inject our annotation with JavaScript, uh, and then I loop through the words on the page so first I use get page number of words, then I use get page nth word to get me a specific word on the page, and then I store them in an array, and then output 
each of the um, or, uh, words on the page and that will show me the words of the PDF. And then I could submit that to an external server. So a user would have to click anywhere on the page. I could then steal the contents of that unknown PDF totally blind and it could go to my server. Another cool uh, technique that I came up with is using SSRF via a PDF injection, which is really exciting because it'll allow you to chain, to chain different vulnerabilities together. So here again, I used the base Chrome injection that I mentioned. And this time, instead of injecting a form button, I inject a text field and give this text field a parameter name. So using the T dictionary key, you can specify a parameter name and the V dictionary key will allow you to specify a parameter value. And then I use the submit form function and pass these arguments to the submit form function that will allow me to make a request. And this is what the request looks like. So interestingly, there's no content type header, but I can control the um, the post the, the, the post parameters. So here I control foo and bar. And also interestingly, you can um, embed raw new lines in the request, which can be useful for other attacks such as request smuggling. After exploiting Chrome injections, I thought, how about one that works on both clients? That would be pretty interesting. And the way I can, I can do that is reuse the existing annotation on Acrobat. So here we reuse the existing annotation and then, which is a URI, but we inject JavaScript, Acrobat happily allows that and that executes using the existing annotation on Acrobat. And then we inject a further annotation with a rectangle specific for Chrome. So it would cover half the page or something. And then when the victim clicks on that, it would then execute JavaScript on Chrome. And if they click on the existing annotation, that would work on Acrobat. So now I'd like to give you a demo of a real-time Chrome injection. So here we have uh, the JS PDF library. They have this cool interface where you can use JavaScript in this box and then generate a PDF in this box. So here we create a new uh, JS PDF object. We set the font size, we create an annotation, and that annotation allows you to specify the X and Y coordinates and the width and height. We give the uh, annotation a type of a link and the URL, and our input will go here, and also um, add the text. So you have, this library supports client-side JavaScript as well as server-side JavaScript. So the server-side stuff works with Node.js, uh, the client-side stuff uh, works in the browser, which is pretty cool for a demonstration. So um, we'll take the injection that I mentioned in my talk. So here we're um, injecting a new annotation with a, a rectangle for the area. Um, we use the per, um, dictionary key to specify the form button and we use our, uh, we inject JavaScript that will just simply call the alert box. So if I copy that, and then if we inject into the URL property, so this is injecting raw PDF code in the URL property. So normally the attack would occur in a post request, for example, but for uh, the purposes of demoing, I'm showing you a client-side uh, JavaScript representation instead. So we've injected our PDF code, and now, as you can see, the entire document is clickable. You click on it, and we get our alert box. So that's how um, a PDF injection would work. So this could uh, apply um, to a non-blind situation where you know the structure of the PDF, or a blind situation where you would call the submit form function to post to an external URL. Now, interestingly, Chrome um, will only allow you to call JavaScript or uh, 
sorry, not call JavaScript, to call the form submission only with a user interaction event. So that's something to bear in mind. So um, whilst testing various PDF uh, generation software and testing various sites, I came across a HR application that was vulnerable to PDF upload. And what was interesting was I could use insert scripts, fantastic technique to read same origin resources. And that was really cool, but the WAF was blocking the PDF user agent. So my, my attack wasn't working, which was so unfortunate. But thankfully I came around, I found a solution to, to bypass that by using cache resources. So as long as the uh, resource was cached, I could read that using this technique without uh, triggering the, the WAF, which was pretty cool. So to wrap up, um, PDF libraries should escape PDF strings. That includes parentheses and backslashes. If you don't escape any of those characters, then you're in trouble to and vulnerable to PDF injection. You can confirm that your uh, software is uh, not vulnerable to these attacks by using the vectors mentioned in this post and then confirming that none of them execute. Consider putting validation on user input going inside PDFs to prevent these sort of attacks. So I was inspired greatly by uh, a lot of people for this PDF talk, but in particular, um, insert script was definitely um, very insp inspirational for my talk. His talk on uh, PDF mess, mess with the web was fantastic and groundbreaking. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I didn't know anything about a PDF until I watched and Albertini's talk on how to write a PDF. And that was so useful and so easy to understand. Um, it was um, brilliant uh, work from him. And without that, I would not have been able to do this talk. And also Ben and Cody, um, they inspired the uh, SSRF attack that I proposed uh, based on their work with using PDFs and using an SSRF attack. So what do I want to you to take away from this talk? Well, vulnerable libraries make user input inside PDFs dangerous. Chrome and Acrobat enable these injections and one link can compromise the contents of a PDF. If you want some further reading and also injection samples, then please visit our post here. And I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I'll take five minutes for questions. Thank you.